Rhyming Dialogue 7 Hi. Hi. How was your week? Was it bleak or unique? More like oblique. It was a challenging work week. How was yours? Same as yours, filled with challenging underscores. I'm glad the weekend is here, and I can essentially disappear from the outside world for a while. It makes me smile. Do I count as an outsider in your world? Maybe, but you feel more like a voice unfurled from somewhere inside my own sensory vat, like a part of me wearing a different hat. Why do I feel like you're kind of implying that I'm a figment of your imagination solidifying? Ha, huh, maybe you are, which would be interesting and bizarre. Imagine me talking to myself in rhyme this whole time. Uh, let's not go there. I might disappear and get trapped forever in a glitch of lowered frequency pitch. Dum-dum-dum. Anyway, speaking of imagination, what's with that formation? Do you mean why or how do we have the ability to ideate, concoct, or fabricate novelties with versatility? Yes, that's what I mean. It's one of those things that seem to set us apart from most other animals on the scene. Maybe, but animals do seem to dream. And dreaming does seem to be linked to imagining, like a kind of possibility refashioning. Whether animals can do it or can't, imagination does seem to be a kind of subsequent implant along the evolutionary chain, which allows for a technical or artistic or inventive gain of comparative function at our stratum of junction. Right. From a very young age, we begin to imagine and play. We start utilizing and exercising our imagination right away. Yeah, as if we have this innate ability to conceive potential realities beyond the one that we perceive. Maybe imagination is what we call our ability to sense hyperdimensional realities that give pretense to that which exists but cannot be apprehended by our limited senses that are physically suspended in three dimensions, not unlimited extensions. What? You lost me on that one. Sorry, let me try to have some fun by dragging it out and trying to schlep what I meant step by step. First, let's discuss dimensions for a few seconds. Okay, but don't get too thorough. I won't. Let's start with zero. A point has zero dimensions because it has no extensions. A line has one dimension because it extends in one direction. A square is two-dimensional because it is extendable both side to side and up to down. The same for a circle that is round. Cubes and spheres extend three-dimensionally because they extend three ways spatially. They have more breadth, height, width, and depth. Okay, so what would four dimensions look like? Well, in 3D, shadow or ghost-like. If you project a cube's or a sphere's shadow onto a flat wall, the shadow projection will be two-dimensional. If a fourth-dimensional object was projected into three-dimensional space, we would only be able to perceive three of its dimensions in this place. The same way a cube shadow displays less information and depth, a four-dimensional hypercube would lose information in this limited breadth. A hypercube is a four-dimensional cube? Yes. If we had some kind of four-dimensional cube tube that allowed us to perceive how four dimensions in three would seem, the way we use 3D glasses to see three dimensions on a 2D screen, we'd be able to see all sides at once. We'd no longer be a blind spot dunce. 4D glasses and a 3D screen would project a scene where we'd see the top, bottom, sides, front, back, and inside all at once at the same time, all in the same stride. So kind of like x-ray vision. Even more than that, more like supervision. You'd see upside down, inside out, all sideways and backwards, in addition to downside up, outside in, all sideways and forwards. 
Imagine any 3D object spinning on three axes simultaneously while peeling and unpeeling insides out and outsides in punctiliously. Right. I'm not sure if I can, except set into motion and through a time span. Yes, yes, yes. That's how we process any dimensional leap through our mind's eye. Additional time and space must apply. If we draw a point out straight through time and space, we've just created a one-dimensional space. If we smear a line sideways through time and space, we've just created a two-dimensional space. If we pull a square up and out through time and space, we've just created a three-dimensional space. To visualize anything through and through is to conceptualize a four-dimensional debut. Okay, okay, I get the whole dimensional thing. Remember, we were going to talk about imagining. Oh, yes. I was trying to suggest that just as we use our physical sensation to perceive and gather information in physical 3D reality, maybe we use imagination to perceive and gather information about the 4D construct into which 3D reality may erupt. Do you mean like a sort of virtual layer for which imagination is the surveyor? Yes. Just as we have screens through which we can portray and absorb vicarious things, and virtual reality through which we can have experiences of non-physically derived vicarious sensory variances, doesn't imagination tap into a plane where existence isn't under constraint of being trapped in a physical domain with limitation, resistance, and strain? Please try to spell this out for me more simply. If I imagine what it's like to feel sad, that's not the same as actually feeling sad. If I imagine what it's like to pet a dog, that's not the same as actually petting a dog. If I imagine what it's like to get burned, that's not the same as actually getting burned. If I imagine what it would be like to see a ghost, that's not the same as actually seeing a ghost. The imagination plane isn't contained or constrained within the physics with which matter is sustained. Remember when the serpent tempted Adam and Eve's will to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil? No, I don't remember the event, but I remember the story to some extent. God warned if they ate from the tree, they would surely die. The serpent said if they did, they surely would not die. Rather, they would know wrong from right and become like gods. Who in their right mind could possibly pass up those odds? We were talking about being imaginative, and now you're talking about a biblical narrative. I know, try to bear with my explanation for a bit longer of a duration. In an anything-goes, anything-is-possible kind of virtual reality, there is no good or evil, wrong or right, because that jamboree has no physical basis or hypostasis to feel, sense, and endure any kind of pain or pleasure. Are you trying to say that if an awareness existed solely in an imaginary plane, it couldn't harness or possess or reach physicality, thus it would have no morality? Yes. Without a physical body that is expiring, there would be no sinning, hurting, lying, or crying. To be able to see every simultaneous characteristic and property of everything materialistic from outside of and above is to get rid of being trapped inside of and within the viewpoint and potential for mortal sin. We don't mind killing or torturing in a video game as long as those characters can't feel the same as we would if we were getting killed or crushed, zapped or blown up, tortured, maimed or flushed. Yes, but imagine if creating such a world and playing such a game generated a real version in another dimension or on another plane. To us, it's just for fun, just a simulation, but to them, it's an actual incarnation. Right. So what I was trying to get at with the Garden of Eden habitat was that just as our imagination seems to have the less limited propensity to move through time and space and operate on a whole different density, then our thick, heavy, hungry, slow, sensing, thinking, feeling bodies of flesh 
stuck and entrapped within this physicality mesh. Perhaps that imagination plane is the shadow that we see, projected onto ours from the next dimension or density. The fall? Yes, a fall from 4D into 3D. We recreate and simulate the fall all the time. We replay it not just in reality, but in mind. We trap and memorialize 3D reality scenes into 2D photographs and movie screens. When too many of us push and move towards the same limited goal, we slow down further and funnel into lines displaying further control. When we attempt to indoctrinate, rehabilitate, or punish, we restrict and condition by locking into singular relative points of space known as church, school, and prison. It's useful, though, to experience friction. We learn a lot through constraint and restriction. I agree. Perhaps it's even necessary. When kids are growing up, the more freedom they gain, the more responsibility they have to maintain. They have to learn to play by the rules of the game if they want to keep leveling up to each new plane. Try to tie it all together, please. Don't leave me balancing on this trapeze. Well, if it's possible that this 3D plane is a fall or a trap, then perhaps there is some way to get out, get back, or tap existence on the next level up or advance through this game in this physical expanse. If there was a cheat code, would you want to use it anyway? Isn't that what the serpent offered to enable this fated gateway? Yes, right. After man became like gods, knowing good from evil, they blocked him from eating of the tree of life and living forever retrieval. So I guess the point is that we must live, learn, and then die, while cursedly earning and extrapolating all the rules that apply. We advance like children advancing into adulthood, only catching glimpses and imagining of what we would or could or should be like at the next level, the next stage, hoping all the while that we don't get cursed back into a stone age. Yeah, I don't want to be a caveman, do you? No, no thank you. Then let's not forget just how far we've come, how much space-time has been distorted to arrive at this outcome. We've come from a fall, knowing practically nothing at all, to a time like now where we know how, to effectively and artificially clone a serpent and a fruit tree. Yes, indeed. Now let me go so I can weed, and erect cherubim and a flashing flaming sword around my garden gate to deflect the curious horde. That's good. You're doing your chores, probably racking up really high scores. Ha. Huh. We'll save the faith versus deeds problem for a future entry in this column. Okay. Bye. Bye.